we had no understanding of the Vietnamese whatsoever. If we had, we could have solved so, so many problems that we created over there. My name is Sewell Jones. I was um, with 3rd Marines, 1968-69, uh, on the DMZ. I was a grunt, carried a rifle, and people asked me what I knew about Vietnam when I went over there. And after being a year in Vietnam, I realized what I knew about Vietnam was the 10 feet around me, because that's all I cared about. I, I wasn't in country too terribly long, probably about two or three months. And I really started asking a lot of serious questions about what I was doing over there and what my country was doing over there and what was going on in the war. Uh, however, I didn't have the courage to lay my rifle down, which I should have done at that time. And I tell people now in a very odd sort of way that it's, it's much easier to continue killing than it is to lay the rifle down and not kill. Because when you... When you lay the rifle down, when you, when you stop the killing, then you go against, you're going against your brothers, you're in your country, your friends, you're going against everything you believe to be true. So you, what you do, in order to maintain that love you want to maintain between you and your family, you continue killing. Uh, what you don't realize at the time, you're killing yourself. Every time you do something, you're killing yourself. After returning to the USA, I tried to be normal. I, I got married and had a job. and. I did everything I was supposed to do to be normal, but normal wasn't there. I never could find it, never could see it again. And I remember walking into my mother and father's house in 1969, and at one time that place had been a great place of secure, security and love. But after going to Vietnam and being involved in a war and coming home, when I walked in that first day, for some reason, which I could not tell you at that time, it was a very scary place to be. And everything I saw, which was normal, the toothpaste, the rug, the old, the old table that I knew so well as a child, all of that became very dangerous to me. I didn't recognize it anymore. And so therefore, my best way of solving that problem was to run, which is what I did. Basically, I ran to a bottle, <clears throat> and I ran to a bunch of smoke, uh, marijuana, LSD, you name it, and I did it. But it never seemed to solve the problem. And then finally, about 1990, I'm guessing, uh, well, then I moved to Alaska. And I, bought, I live in a cabin in Alaska in the mountains, which is 100 miles from the closest town. And I just isolated myself in the mountains, chopping wood, hauling water, didn't have any electricity for 20 years, probably, and just completely disappeared off the face of the earth because I couldn't deal with what was going on. And I would just sit on my back deck, smoke pot, sip my whiskey, and watch the glacier move. A friend of mine told me one day, he's a good friend of mine, and he finally said, I'm not going to come out here and see you anymore. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I'm, watch I'm tired of watching you kill yourself in a very slow way. He said, it's time you got off the damn seat, put out, to put out the pot, and go get some therapy. So about 19, I think it's 1990, I don't remember all the dates anymore. Uh, also failed history on dates. Um, I started going to s getting some therapy. I started working on trying to understand what was going on inside of me. And I finally put myself into a hospital for, they wanted three months, I only stayed for a month, for PTSD program. After I left that program, I decided it was time for me to return to Vietnam and just see the country. I knew nothing about the country. I knew nothing about the people. I knew nothing about their history. In fact, I just knew absolutely nothing. So by returning to Vietnam, I got to see the place that I once fought, and I got to understand that people are people and not enemies anymore. My first day in uh, Saigon, which is Ho Chi Minh City, I was sitting in my hotel, and I was too afraid to walk outside. I didn't know how I would be received. So I finally said, okay, you didn't come, you know, 10,000 miles to sit in your hotel. So I slipped on my shoes, and I walked out, and I said, walk one time around the block. And I started walking, and a Vietnamese man stopped me, and his broken uh, pidgin English asked me, he says, uh, 
have you been here before? And I thought, well, here it goes. That's why I'm here. I said, yeah, I was here before, uh, 1968 with Third Marines. And he looked at me for a, just a half a second, and he kind of pointed his finger like this, and he says, uh, you're the enemy. And I, my, my heart just fell, and I really wanted to run. I really, really wanted to run. And I said, yeah, I said, I'm, I'm the enemy, all right. And he put his arms around me, and he said, welcome to Vietnam. And here are these two grown men standing on a street corner hugging each other and crying like babies. And I, then I realized this is going to be okay. They don't hate me. I hate myself maybe, but the Vietnamese don't hate me. And I have been told time and time and time again, I may not like your country, and I may not like your presidents, but you're a young man, you were doing what your country asked, and I don't hate you. And when I started hearing that, and I started believing it, then I, I think that was my point of healing, thinking, well, if they don't hate me, and if they're not angry at me, why am I angry at myself? So I left Vietnam, and I went to India. Um, a, little, a little bit out of date here, but anyway, I went to India and like, joined an ashram. And I was going to, I guess, you know, be enlightened. I had my red robe and my head shaved, and I was going to find my peace through the ashram. In the process of doing this, I got involved with a therapy program. And basically what it was, you lived in a room like this with 18 or 20 people, and you lived together, you bathed together, you ate together, you went to the toilet together. There was no separation whatsoever. And you were in total silence 12 hours a day. And but the day, the, the time you were not in silence, you could say anything to anybody about anything. The only rule was you could not physically harm each other and so we were talking one day and there was probably of this 18 in the room I would say 15 were German and these Germans got so angry and they were just screaming and yelling and, and saying vile things to each other and I and it triggered me triggered my something inside of me and I jumped up and I said you know you're all a bunch of Nazis I don't care what it's in your DNA it's in your toenails it's, it grows out of your hair you're a bunch of Nazis you can't help it but I had to stop at that moment and think, who's the only one in this room that took a rifle, marched into a country, and killed a bunch of in innocent people? Who's the Nazi around here? And once I got to that depth of my pain, once I really got to that question, and I started asking myself, am I really evil? Am I a Nazi? Am I really that bad of a person? I don't feel like it. And then I realized I have one sin on my shoulders in Vietnam and one sin only. I trusted my government to treat me in a just and honorable way, and they did not do that. They sent me to an immoral war to do nothing but immoral acts and kill four million innocent people. I have people sometimes ask me, how many people did you kill in Vietnam? I say, four million. And they always look at me like, yeah, you sure. I don't care if you're a clerk typist. I don't care if you were cleaning uniforms in the USA. I don't care if you were on a med cruise with the Navy. You were involved in the killing of four million people. Those of us who supported the war was involved. And I, after writing, when I started writing this book, I realized the guys that came home and, di and, and really protested against the war and tried to stop the war were my true heroes. I didn't have the courage to do that. I disappeared into the, into the wilderness. I never protested against the war. I never tried to stop the war. I let the killing continue. So now I have two sins on my shoulder. But I have finally come to terms with this, and I feel comfortable about with who I am. But returning to Vietnam and meeting the people where I'm always treated honorably, I'm always treated as a friend, I'm always treated as a brother, I'm invited into homes. People will come up to me and hand me their babies because they just... I'm an elder over there, so I'm respected as we're not respected over here. And it just changed my humanity. I found my humanity again by returning to the place that I fought. Now, I want to say real quick, I don't want just to be a monologue. I want to be a dialogue. If you have any questions, any comments, anything you want me to answer, just speak up, raise your hand, and I'll be glad to um, answer what you want to know. Mr. George. Yeah, I spend a lot of time, 
when I moved to Vietnam, I, I lived 10 years in Hanoi, um, the, heart, the heartland of the enemy. Um, I now live in Da Nang, which is a beautiful coastal town. But by going to Hanoi, I started working with a group called the Vietnam Friendship Village. It's a small residential hospital, oh, 120 kids, 30 to 40 North Vietnamese veterans are there at any given time. And it's run by the Veterans Association of Vietnam. So now I find myself working with the North Vietnamese veterans. And I find myself working with the very people we shot at each other. So I have a, I, in, in Vietnam, things can be very formal. Uh, if I'm speaking and I say something, you hear a little. So I said, you know, I'm a, I'm, this formality is getting old. I'm, I'm going to break this down today. So I asked you, everybody, I said, um, how many people here today in a room like this were at the Corviet River, May 68, uh, 1968? And usually it'll be a half a dozen hands go up because it was a huge month-long battle. And I was shot in that battle. So I, I said, how many of you were there? And he used his hands go up. And I said, okay, now, I know you were there. Now I want to know which one of you shot me. I said, I know one of you did it, and I want to know who it is. And it gets deathly quiet for a moment. Then they start volunteering. No, it was me. No, 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 it was me. No, it was me. And one guy told me, oh, you were just too big to miss. <laughs> but what that does, it breaks it down and gets it down to a human level. And then they start pulling up their shirts, and you know, I got shot here, shrapnel here, stabbed here, and they start telling me their stories. And I was in combat for a year. I was shot twice, picked up too many bodies, carried too many body parts, and I'm thinking in my little brain how much I had seen and endured, and I start talking to my Vietnamese brothers, and they were down there 10, 12, 15 years. And when they got shot, they were dragged under a tree somewhere, and maybe had some leaves stuck into their land, you know, because they had no medicine. So I'm, I've been very, very humble living in Vietnam, but mostly I've been helped so much by people inviting me in and treating me as a, as a human being, and I never treated them as a human being. Now, they're, now we're just brothers, and it feels very, very good. So I encourage all veterans to return to Vietnam and, and meet the people again. I've been taking um, bit, uh, small groups of veterans back. And after about a week of being invited into the homes, of meeting the Vietnamese, of, of, of becoming a small part of the community where they are, every veteran I've ever taken back always asks one question. What in the hell were we doing here? That's a good question. Now, what in the hell were we doing here? And the second thing I've heard every veteran say, including myself, I wish I had gone back sooner. I wish I had gone back and met the people as a people. Because you cannot hate people when you see them crying, when you meet their children, when they invite you into their houses. But when you can call them gooks and slopeheads, when you can hate them for that, then it becomes, the, the killing becomes too easy. It's easier to live in denial than accept your, your, your role in a very immoral war. It's just very, very difficult to accept the fact that what you did was wrong. And I, it took me many years to come to this. And I finally said, you know, it was wrong. And I cannot be, a, is this, a, there's nothing heroic about it. It was wrong, war is wrong. And I don't care about World War II, it's wrong. It's evil, it's horrible. And we, do, we don't want to participate in these things. And that's one reason I wrote this book and one reason I'm speaking because this is also written for the young men and women of Iraq. You've got to lay down the gun. You've got to stop the killing. I support these young men and women when they are back in the USA. I don't support the killing. I don't support what we're doing in Iraq or Afghanistan. But I do support them when they come back home and lay down the gun. And sometimes we just cannot, he still cannot lay down his gun. It's easier to live in denial. But you can also probably, when you talk to him, understand the pain that he lives in, or he wouldn't have responded in such a manner. And too many vets out there my age are not alive today because they lived in pain, and the best way to end the pain was either a bottle, an accident, a gun, or something of that nature. Uh, there's too many people took their lives after the war. And that same thing is gonna be, will be happening very, 
It's happening today. These young, see, when you, when you, go, to, when you go to war, uh, I was in the Marine Corps. They used to tell us in the Marine Corps, there's three people in the Marine Corps. You, the guy on your right, and the guy on your left. You take care of him, he takes care of you, you take care of him. That's the only three people in the Marine Corps. The hell with everybody else. You, you, you have to take care of each other. Well, when you go through this experience together, it's almost like being, it's, it's more than being lovers, you know. I mean, it, you become so bonded and so attached that when you leave there, to go against the war is to go against them and to go against everybody else. And it's just extremely hard to do. Uh, some guys had the courage to do that. I didn't. And that's the reason I disappeared into the woods. And I did exactly what your friend did for so many years. And by finally just willing to look and ask some questions, I started finding some redemption inside of myself. So I just feel very, very sorry for him that he, that he can't come out and be with, you know, vets for peace. Um, I have a good friend in Da Nang, and we're just, we were in Vietnam together. We fought together. He's a Marine. He loves being a Marine. He's my age. And we have a picture. We have our arms around each other. He's wearing a T-shirt, and it says, Hardcore Marine. And I'm wearing a T-shirt, and it says, Vets for Peace. But we, we understand each other. And, I, and I, love this, I love him dearly, and he loves me. And we understand that some ways we were both right and we're both wrong. But my friend can't give it up either. We, we were uh, children, actually, of World War II. I had four uncles in World War II. I had three cousins in, in, in uh, Korea. And when it came my turn, there was no question asked. So, but what happens is you take a young man and you put him in a foreign country. Once you're in combat, once you're in that situation, patriotism lasts maybe five minutes, and then it's all over with. Then it's survival. It's all about survival and absolutely nothing else. Uh, you know, I don't care who wins the war if I'm dead. It makes no, who cares? So it really becomes a thing about survival and not about fighting for freedom and fighting for democracy or, you know, anything else, a patriotic story they tell you. But what you do, you put young men and women now into a situation that no matter what decision they make, it's wrong. So if I'm walking through a ville or a village and I see some movement over here and I turn and fire and I kill three children, well, if I hadn't turned and fired, maybe I was dead. I was, you know, so you can't win. You kill somebody trying to stay alive and you find out it was a woman, a child, or maybe she had her baby with her. Then, you, then as a young man, you have to live with this. But if you hadn't fired, maybe you and your friends were killed. You don't know. You don't know these things. So they, you, you get stuck in a situation where you cannot win. You cannot make the right decision. It's totally and completely impossible to make the right decision. And then you have to find some way to live with it. Her friend denies it. I couldn't deny it. I just kept eating and eating and eating at me, and I finally started reading and asking questions. But what we do, we, you know, as a, as a young man, I am hardwired to protect. I'm a protector. Um, somebody breaks in my house, I don't expect my wife to run out there and protect me. I'm a male. I go out there and protect her. I, we're hardwired to do this. And what our government does is take this natural instinct and abuse it and abuse it by telling these young boys, you gotta go fight, you gotta help you. You know, now they tell you, oh, you gotta go fight for um, American democracy in Iraq. Well, what, what does Iraq have to do with American freedom other than oil? Nothing whatsoever. What did Vietnam have to do with America, freedom in America? Nothing, absolutely nothing. And after 35 years of reading and studying, I still can honestly say I have no idea what that war was about. I have come to the conclusion that what really happened in Vietnam started in, the, um, in Cuba, in the Bay of Pigs, because the Bay of Pigs was a fiasco. A young president named Kennedy was, was called a weak president because he wouldn't send military in to support these rebels going back into Cuba. He was considered a weak president. So his advisor said, hey, John, here's what we're going to do. We're going to send 1,500 troops to Vietnam. 
Who ever heard of Vietnam? Nobody's going to get hurt. You're going to get big headline press that you're fighting against the communists. You will look powerful now, and you can get reelected. So he wanted to look like a strong president, so he sent these troops over there. He gets killed. In the meantime, Johnson says, how in the hell am I going to get reelected? They tell him, look like a strong president. So he keeps the troops over there until he got elected, and he didn't have enough nerve ever to back off because he always wanted to be strong. So my theory is two presidents wanted to be elected or re-elected. Four million people in Vietnam, 6,000 American troops are dead, and it's only because two ambitious men wanted to be elected. Now, that gets you right down to the knife point. You can talk about democracy. You can talk about freedom. You can talk about domino theories. You can talk about a lot of things. But when you get it right down to it, two men wanted to be made president, and four million Vietnamese died. I was in a Marine Reserve unit, and it was Memorial Day. And we were mar proudly marching. Memorial Day, some be peace protesters was stopping the parade, and I've got a picture of me on the front page of the Houston Chronicle, and I've got this guy's shirt like that, and I'm just getting ready to unload on him. So there was no love for, the, for them, no love whatsoever, and I was violently opposed to the protesters. When I returned, even though I kept to myself, I was very, very proud of the, of the, of the warriors who came back and said, no more, no more, no more. And, and then I just realized, how strong these young men were, how really, really powerful they were. That takes a lot of courage to do that. Both sides take a lot of courage, but to go to war and come home and stand up and say no more, to me that takes a lot of courage because you're going against every belief system you ever had. And you have to finally stand back and say, I don't believe. When I came back from Vietnam, what I found out many years after the fact, I didn't have a belief system. I didn't believe in my church. And I was a very devout Southern Baptist boy. Uh, I didn't believe in my teachers because they had lied to me about World War II and all of what happened over there. I didn't trust my uncles. I didn't trust my fathers, my mother. They sent me to war without question. I had no belief system. I had nothing to stand on. I had nothing to, no direction. So I had to rebuild my whole life from the bottom up and find, my, and find a platform that I could stand on and believe again. So it's, um, I, when you say which side, both sides. I've asked myself a million times, what did these young men who refused to go to war know that I didn't know? And why did I choose to go to war and they didn't. And I think what the truth is, if you really, really want to get down to that core value of yourself, I wanted my family to love me so much and honor me so much, I was willing to go to war and kill a lot of innocent people to maintain their respect and love for me. I've given this book to everyone in my family, not one person will read it. I just said, uh, thank you very much, and that's the end of it. That's how my family, and even today, 40 years after the fact, my nephews who were not even alive, in a sense, they reject me also. That's a tough one. The longer I stay in Vietnam, the less I know about Vietnam. Uh, and, I, and I realize that Vietnam is a country of spirits. It is a spirit country. Um, today, there are approximately 300,000 Vietnamese who are missing in action. And when these bodies are not returned home, the, the spirit will, and this was also in the native, uh, like the, it roams forever seeking its place. And it can't find its place until it can go home. And, there, and it's a very, very big problem in Vietnam. And, and these people are looking everywhere trying to find a fragment, something that they can take home and put in their family altar and say, now you're home with us. It is, it, everything about Vietnam is spirit. We don't understand it. I had a young, there's a term called Viet Q, and it's for Vietnamese who live over here and born in USA. And, they, and, and a young Viet Q girl was studying in Hanoi, and I had speaking to her class. And after class, she uh, asked me, she says, and also another beautiful thing about Vietnam, 
if they uh, like you, you become a family member. And it depends on your age relationship. Most young people in their 20s will call me uncle. Um, the younger ones call me oh no, a grandfather. Or I may be little brother, I may be older brother, but you become a family member. So a lot of people call me uncle. And so this young lady, she's an American. She was born in this area, I think. And she said, uncle, she said, do you believe in spirits? And I said, no, but your mother does. And she jumped back and she said, how do you know that? I said, because your mother is sitting at your kitchen table telling you about talking with auntie who died during the war. She the, she the, she's part of this spirit world. You're not. You may look Vietnamese, but you're American. You, that spirit world is gone. But to the Vietnamese, that spirit world is part of every ounce of their body. Their whole soul is wrapped up in it. So, and the land is like that because that land, they have what they call the heaven and earth. And we used to bomb of these villages, and the very next day they go back in. And we'd bomb the village, and then the next day they go back in. And we continued this over and over. And we kept saying, what is wrong with these stupid people? My God, you know, what is, these people are nuts. No, that's their spirit point on earth. That's how they maintain their relationship with heaven and earth, because that's where their ancestors are. We didn't know this. We had no understanding of the Vietnamese whatsoever. If we had, we could have solved so, so many problems that we created over there. Part of my work now, part of George's work, part of Vets for Peace, part of Peace for Justice, is help these young men, help these young women find their humanity again so they can live in a... In a, in a in, the, in this world. I do not support the war in Iraq. I do not support the war in Afghanistan. I do not support young men and women killing people. You bring them home and I support them going to school. I support them getting their, the proper medication, whatever they need. But I cannot and will not ever support another war, even if people call it just. Mm -hmm.